Good afternoon, everyone. And happy uh, almost women, uh, International Women's Day. No, technically, it's, it is in Australia. Oh. <laughs> well, now, happy birthday, women. Uh, I'm Jane Harmon, uh, the first uh, president and CEO of the Wilson Center who happens to be a woman. Um, and I am absolutely delighted to be here today with uh, uh, other women leaders and especially with the women to my left. Uh, a special w welcome to Julie Collins, Australian Minister for the Status of Women, and Joe Goodhue, New Zealand's Minister of Women's Affairs. We, uh, and I'll mention in a moment, rock, resident rock star, Rangita de Silva de Alves. But we were supposed to be joined by Tina Chen, uh, of the White House. However, does everybody know where she is? That, no, she's here. She's with the President who, as we speak, or maybe half an hour ago, I'm not sure, but it was supposed to be at 145, is signing, finally, into law the extension of the Violence Against Women's Act, Women Act, VAWA, <laughs> which passed our Congress after 16 months of agony and which had expired. Uh, I, voted against, I, I voted for it as a member of Congress uh, when it was first enacted, and it seems to me uh, that, uh, um, as they say here, it's a no-brainer. How can anyone be against steps to stop violence against women? Oh, coming in the door is Hale Esfandiari, who is the head of our Middle East program. She also happens to be a woman. Uh, <laughs> right now in New York, the 57th UN Commission on the Status of Women is convening to address the necessary steps that must be taken to protect women and girls from violence in every country around the world. Uh, it's a truism now, and it's just terribly tragic that women have become a weapon of war. And uh, we can see it. It's not just women. It's obviously girls, too. Uh, Rashida Manju, the UN Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women and one of our key partners, has rightly, urge, rightly urged the U.S. government to reauthorize VAWA, but now that it's renewed, we need to continue to build on accomplishments and strive for more adequate responses uh, from authorities uh, to provide protection to victims and to assure accountability for perpetrators. The human cost of violence is incalculable, and from a purely economic standpoint, the U.S. loses over four billion dollars annually, I'm sure that's a low figure, from intimate partner violence. Most of it perpetrated male against female, not all of it. Uh, as both a lawyer and legislator myself, I've learned from personal experience over the years that the best ways to pass laws that guarantee and protect the rights of all, in including the, rights, the right to personal security, uh, is to get women seats at decision-making tables. And that means all sectors, public, private, and civil society. The Wilson Center takes this as a top priority through our action platform, the Global Women's Leadership Initiative, GWLI. This initiative includes the Women in Public Service Project, which was founded in 2011 by Secretary Clinton, the U.S. Department of State, and the historic Seven Sister Women's Colleges here in the United States. Uh, now housed here at the Wilson Center, uh, this flagship project has emerged as the premier learning and mentoring institute for women in public service. Our mission is 50 by 50. That means we're seeking to inspire a new generation of women leaders to realize the goal of at least 50 percent women in positions of political, public, and civic leadership worldwide by 2050. We do this through our global leadership institutes, conferences, and two-way mentoring programs. Two-way two mentoring means that it's not just the mentor, um, uh, the grandma like me, uh, who transmits knowledges to, knowledge to the mentee, uh, some of the young women in this room, but it goes the other way too. Young women have an enormous amount to teach me, and I am thrilled to learn from them. Uh, we need everyone, both here in Washington and around the world, to commit not just to the protection of women and girls, but to their political and economic empowerment. Part of that is our distinguished minister's commitment to the Women in Public Service Project. Thank you both very much. We salute the work that is led by the governments of Australia and New Zealand on women's leadership and welcome our partnership to meet the shared goals of, shared goals of 50 by 50. 
But going forward, we need more. We need multi-sectoral commitments from all levels of society, from the grassroots to the international roots. We need legal reform, economic empowerment, national and international policies, and action plans. We need to marry international security with personal security. After all, personal security is economic security, is national security. Let me now turn the discussion over to the director, the vaunted director of our GWLI uh, initiative and a true rock star, Rangita De Silva de Alwes. Thank you. Thank you, Congresswoman Harmon. So against the backdrop of the Commission on the Status of Women's 57th session and on the eve of International Women's Day, we are delighted to host a conversation with two very distinguished global women leaders and to rededicate our efforts to address violence against women and girls, not just as the primary focus of the CSW, but the global focus from now on. As we celebrate International Women's Day, we join Michelle Bachelet, the head of UN Women, in echoing her forceful message, enough is enough. No more violence against women. Enough to child marriage, enough to honor crimes and acid crimes, enough to kitchen crimes and dowry deaths, enough to rape as a tool of war. When one in three women around the world face violence in their lifetime, when every day in the US three women are murdered by an intimate partner, when violence is at the proportion of an epidemic, violence against women is the urgent cause of our times. We heard it this morning and we are going to hear it this evening threats against human security, threats against women's security, pierce the very heart of the security of our nations. And today, we remember and pay tribute to the (coughs) sparkling (coughs) and courageous Malala and her shining spirit, young Malala who was gunned down on her way to school, We also honor the young medical student brutally raped just a few months ago in India who succumbed to her injuries. We also remember and support the women who gathered in Tahrir Square just two years ago on this very day to celebrate International Women's Day and who were beaten back and told it is not your time, it is not your day. We raise our voice in support of all those women who, along with Michel Bachelet, say enough is enough. No to violence against women. So my first question is to Minister Julie Collins, who is the Minister for Indigenous Employment, Economic Development, and the Status of Women. The GWLI, the Global Women's Leadership Initiative, had a very auspicious start when at our inauguration, We hosted a lunch for Minister Penny Wong, who is a dear colleague of Minister Julie Collins, and who then introduced us to Minister Julie Collins. So welcome to our home. Welcome to the Women in Public Service Project. You've been very much a part of the history of the program, and we know that you will continue to be the future of the Women in Public Service Project. The Australian domestic violence law is a model law that we at the Wilson Center use as a benchmark and as a blueprint in our lawmaking initiatives around the world, especially in the Asian region. And in June of 2012, Australia revised its domestic violence law under the leadership of Minister Julie Collins and broadened the law to target and include emotional abuse as an important category of violence against women. As most of you know, historically, violence against women, domestic violence has been defined in very narrow terms as including only physical violence. The very way in which Australia has now defined domestic violence to cover much more than physical harm is a really a clarion call to action around the world. 
The Australian Federal Attorney General Nicola Roxanne, who was one of the architects of the changes in the family law, says that uh, some of the invisible actors and the invisible victims of, of violence must be brought to the law and must be covered in the protections of the law, including children and family members who are often doubly victimized and are some of the biggest victims of violence against women. And the Indian domestic violence law has also broadened its category of emotional violence and verbal and emotional violence to include abuse that is associated with the giving and the taking of dowry, as well as the inability to bear a child or the inability to bear a male child, is now defined as emotional abuse at the realm of physical abuse. So Minister Collins, I want you to speak about your struggle and the leadership that you brought to bear in revising this law and the ways in which this law is now a clarion call for reform around the world. Thank you. Want me to do it for yes. you? Yes. Okay. Can everybody hear me okay? Uh, Australia has for some time been, um, I guess, dealing with violence against women as most other nations are. We have a national plan to reduce violence against women and their children, uh, which is a 12-year plan, uh, which our government put substantial funds behind. Uh, in Australia, we have a system of uh, governance, I guess, that's a bit similar to the United States, where we have a federal government, then we have states and territory governments, and then we have local governments, so we have the three tiers of government. Uh, the ones that primarily do service delivery in terms of shelters and support for um, survivors of domestic violence are essentially the states and territories. Um, so for us to legislate over states and territories, uh, we have some similar issues to which you would have in the US. Um, so we've had to work with states and territories uh, in getting together our national plan to reduce violence against women and their children. Uh, just late last year, we agreed to set up a national centre of excellence to look at research and best practice on uh, how to prevent violence against women and their children. So the national plan is targeted mostly at prevention of violence against women and children because the service delivery comes from the states and territories. So we've... Uh, announced that just late last year. We've appointed an, an interim chair. We're getting together um, contact details and a premises for that new centre of excellence to start operating. We're also looking at what we can do more in terms of prevention. Uh, we've got a social media campaign targeted at men and boys and young people uh, aged between 15 and 20. It's called The Line, as in what is the line, don't cross the line, in terms of what's appropriate behaviour and respectful relationships. Um, so we've been doing some of that. Uh, we also have a personal safety survey done by the Australian Bureau of Statistics which has looked at the prevalence of violence against women and children in Australia. Uh, one in five Australian uh, women or girls uh, after the age of 15 will have been affected by some form of violence, uh, by some form of violence, so it's one in three of some form of violence, sorry, and one in five of sexual violence. So uh, we're about to do another personal safety survey to look at that. So Australia still does have some issues when it comes to violence against uh, women and children. The other thing that's really quite disturbing in Australia is uh, the murder rate. Uh, almost every week in Australia a woman is killed by a male partner or ex-partner. So some of our states and territories now have some review officers in coroner's offices to see if there's a causal link of domestic violence uh, when a woman dies uh, because it's also been a big issue. So we've been doing a lot of work uh, to try and eradicate violence against women. We, of course, have a long way to go with statistics still like that. Uh, so we are um, doing stuff with legislation, we're doing stuff with services, we're doing stuff in terms of best practice, so we're trying to have a whole suite of things that we can do to try and prevent violence against women and their children in Australia. Thank you, Minister Collins. Under your leadership, you've also criminalised forced marriage and thereby highlighting forced marriage as a category of violence against women and girls. Can you speak very briefly about the ways in which you led this campaign? Uh, well, violence, um, sorry, forced marriage in, in Australia has always been illegal, but a decision was made by our Attorney General, Nicola Roxon, our first female Attorney General, to actually uh, make it a criminal offence. 
uh, to uh, instigate forced marriage in Australia. So that was done uh, just recently. I think it passed both Houses of Parliament just two weeks ago. So it's uh, new legislation. So, of course, nobody has yet uh, been actually, um, uh, you know, been charged under that act at the moment, but uh, it's still in the process, I think, of getting royal assent. So it's uh, criminalisation of forced marriage is a new law in Australia that's only just come in. Thank you. My next question is to Minister Goodhue. Minister Goodhue is the Minister for Community and Voluntary Sector and the Minister for Senior Citizens and the Minister of Women's Affairs. Welcome, Minister Goodhue. Your law, the New Zealand law, is also a blueprint for reform in much of the Asian region. And some of the provisions in the law are groundbreaking. It is the only law so far that covers indirect, the victims who are indirect victims of violence, those who are not in the direct line of violence, but those by virtue of being witnesses to violence are doubly harmed, are as harmed as much as the direct victims mm. of domestic violence, and that is those are the children, the silent victims of domestic violence. And this is the first law in the world that protects the children who are not in the direct line of attack, but suffer enormous emotional damage because of that. And we've been talking about this, violence is learned behavior. And male children often emulate violence that they've, uh, they, they've witnessed. And the girl child, on her part, learn to accept and learn to, um, learn to tolerate violence as something that is normal. So the normalizing of violence in the home takes place at childhood. And that is something that the New Zealand law tries hard to address. And my second question, in order to save time to you, uh, Minister Goodhue, came out of the conversation that we just had outside of this room. Minister Goodhue has been um, instrumental in creating a campaign for, uh, for boys and men to be involved in addressing domestic violence and violence against women in general. She comes in wearing the white ribbon, which is the emblem, which really um, is the symbol of male involvement in campaigns on anti-violence against women. But what is really unique about her campaign is the way in which she is uh, using former members of gangs to speak up against violence against women. Well, thank you for that introduction and for the opportunity to be here in such distinguished company. I really am um, feeling privileged. I'm going to start with the second question because I quickly want to disavow anybody's belief that it was my idea, the <laughs> White Ribbon campaign. <laughs> I, I would love to take the credit for it, but I'm, I'm not going to. It is, however, a wonderful campaign. And in late November each year, you will see many um, New Zealanders wearing um, the White Ribbon for the week around the last week of November. But happily, throughout the rest of the year, you will also see New Zealanders wearing the white ribbon as I do today because the campaign should be all year round. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a campaign called the It's Not OK campaign, and that's been a uh, um, social media campaign which has been about people standing up and saying it's not OK. So the way in which that campaign has run out is that um, advertisements on television, um, pictorial advertisements, um, uh, uh, sort of surveys that people will go through and realise that they're experiencing violence in their life and then coming to the understanding that what they're experiencing is not okay. But also challenges people who are watching to stand up and say that's not okay. Um, challenges children to come to understand that maybe what they're seeing in their lives is not okay. And I, the whole concept of the word okay, I think, is, is quite common um, across countries. People understand what you're saying when you say okay. So um, what we've discovered is that after evaluating the It's Not Okay campaign, that the memories of those advertisements in our um, Māori population have been um, 98 and 99% men and women. They remember the advertisements and large numbers of them have taken action so we know that it is working. But the follow-on from that campaign, the White Ribbon campaign, is a, a day when people say that they don't condone violence against women. 
and it is men and boys in many cases who have been involved in violence within their domestic situation <coughs> who have seen that it's no longer okay for them who are the most powerful proponents of this message. They stand up and they say, I know the damage that I perpetrated on my family members. I know what I've done. And I'm now saying we can do so much better. It's not okay. And join our White Ribbon Crusade. So in, in November, uh, what they talk about is, you know, on average 14 women a year are killed by their partners or ex-partners. And we've got three and a half thousand convictions. I mean, we're a country of four and a half million, not a, a large country, but that's way, way, way too many. So uh, on that campaign, we find motorcycle riders riding from one end of New Zealand to the other. Now there is a parallel ride, there are so many, okay. and they stop at every small town and they get people from that town together and they basically they wave the flag that says, join us in standing up to this. And that's quite a tough place to go for some people. Just to move on to your first question, I know I'm going back round the other way, but you were talking about um, the legislation um, regarding <coughs> the experience of violence for a child. And what the research tells us, that the child who watches mm -hmm. experiences the same dramatic trauma mm -hmm. in their life as the child who is actually experiencing the abuse themselves, the same effects. And that's pr a pretty powerful motivator to do something about it, not just to think that because it wasn't them that was being hit, that it's not as bad. It is, actually. Mm -hmm. it, it totally is. So we have, um, last year, the police implemented a situational response model, which, re which reacts to um, family violence incidents according to the relationship type and the seriousness of the incident. It focuses on intimate partner violence and our statistics are very similar mm -hmm. to Australia's where um, one in five will experience intimate partner violence, um, between one and three, one and four will experience violence at some time in their lives. Um, so along with the, po the focus on um, intimate partner violence, the situational response model has a greater focus on children experiencing abuse, either directly or indirectly. And we found that a child or young person is found present at half of all family mm. violence occurrences attended mm. by the police. So that's, that's a, huge, a huge number of, of what is actually um, being experienced and the police going out and visiting them. So the child risk factor form collects information on the presence of 19 risk factors for children, including unborn children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that includes the child age, mental or physical disability, previous injury through, through family violence, as well as parental history or alcohol or drug use, mental illness and criminal history. And alongside of all this, we had a green paper about that's coming up 18 months to two years ago, followed by a white paper. And what we asked New Zealanders was quite a difficult question. Are you ready to actually go inside the doors of the family home more than we have as a state mm -hmm. and do more than we're doing if we don't accept the number of children who are being harmed right now mm -hmm. in that situation? Mm -hmm. And actually, resoundingly, New Zealanders said, yes, we need to do more. So one of the ways we think, because when we look at um, children who are harmed in these situations, um, what we find is that that old um, phrase of they slipped through the cracks. Mm -hmm. But what that means is they were known to the authorities, their family was known to the authorities mm -hmm. or one of their family members, but the authorities weren't joined up. Mm -hmm. So health wasn't talking to education or it wasn't talking to social services or somebody knew there was something going on, but they weren't spreading the word across those agencies. So we are now piloting two much more joined up approaches, or the same approach in two parts of New Zealand as part of the white paper moving this on. Mm. So there's a very powerful preventative mechanism too of children who will grow up either to perpetrate violence or to be able to tolerate violence and normalize violence. So this interagency mechanism that you've launched is very powerful. My third question is to our co-host. As you know, uh, we are hosting this distinguished event with the Office of the Global Women's Issues at the Department of State. And Tina Chen, who is right now signing 
the Violence Against Women law, and it's, it's so symbolic and propitious that at this moment we are engaging in a conversation that will help to propel this globally. Uh, the Office of the Global Women's Institute at st uh, uh, Office of Women's Issues at the State Department is represented by Wenchi. And I have a question for you, Wenchi. The Violence Against Women's movement around the world has spawned perhaps the greatest success story of local to global mobilizing. And it is these local to global efforts that have led the call for women's leadership at the negotiation table leading to peace and security, and that is why today we celebrate Security Council Resolution 1325, which is a clarion call for women's participation and women's leadership in preventing conflict and in building and forging and keeping peace. We also celebrate, in the U.S., the Action Plan, the, national, the U.S. National Action Plan on Women, Peace, and Security, which was launched in 2011, a day after Secretary Clinton launched the Women in Public Service project. So we really feel a kindred ship to this uh, National Security Plan of Action. And this plan of action has redefined violence against women as a major foreign policy issue and a national security issue. But what are you doing, Wenchi, to make this rhetoric into reality? How do you transform this rhetoric into reality? Thank you, Rangita. I know Tina really wanted to be here uh, representing actually our um, highest political will from the White House to be here, but unfortunately, uh, she has to celebrate the signing of the Violence Against <laughs> Women's Law. <laughs> <laughs> so that's all good. Um, so um, at the State Department, as Rangita said, um, we actually have been working with many countries um, and I'll just use the example of our collaboration with uh, Australia and New Zealand, uh, specifically about how do we really make the action plan into action. <laughs> um, as everyone probably is familiar, I see that many familiar faces who've been working on um, those national security and women's issues for a long time. Um, the National Action uh, for Women, Peace and Security is really about increasing women's uh, participation in decision making. Um, and one of the things that um, Australia, New Zealand, and the United States have been doing um, at the international level is uh, in the South Pacific region. Um, two years ago when Secretary Clinton visited the region, we launched the Pacific Women's Empowerment Initiative, which brought the three countries together to work with the Pacific Islands. Um, many of them um, unfortunately have suffered for a long time um, not having the gender equality um, status that, you know, that many of us could have. And actually in almost all indicators, gender related indicators, the Pacific region, the islands have the lowest mm -hmm. uh, state status for, uh, in the world. Um, the pol political participation is close to 0% <coughs> uh, in the region, and not to mention the rampant uh, gender-based violence and HIV-AIDS affection rate um, and economic empowerment or economic participation is also very low. So thanks to um, our friends, uh, Australia and New Zealand, who actually have a long history in the region, uh, we were able to join the initiative and really demonstrate the United States commitment to uh, gender equality through policy and through having a few policy dialogues, really listening to the Pacific Island uh, women, understanding their concerns. And um, last year, we actually uh, used the opportunity of the Pacific uh, Islands Forum. Uh, Secretary Clinton um, uh, launched together with uh, your leaders um, the phase two of Pacific Women's uh, Empowerment Initiative, which I know Australia has $320 million, um, <laughs> huge foreign aid in the region over 10 years, and the United States and then New Zealand also put in a um, smaller amount, but showed our um, commitment uh, to help um, the women uh, promote their uh, leadership. So that's a very concrete example that we do. But the goal is really to increase women's uh, leadership so um, they can be in decision-making um, positions and therefore can help change whether it's legislation or policies. Thank you, Wenchi. My, my final question to both the ministers 
is um, the Commission on the Status of Women is the highest uh, body globally on policy making for women and girls. And every year at this moment in time, it brings together the highest level women who are heads of state, heads of ministries, with women at the grassroots and the non-governmental organizations and civil society organizations to brainstorm on both the thematic area of focus as well as other areas that impact on that particular focus. And this year's focus is anti-violence against women. Uh, we also know that despite the fact that 125 countries have outlawed violence against women, most of these laws are still privileged in the breach. We also know, as Congresswoman pointed out, that here in the US, violence against women costs the state to the order of, in the minimum, $5 billion. And in Australia, the, the figures are as staggering, and in New Zealand, they are even higher. They're $13 billion a year. In Australia, it's close to the figure in the United States. Despite that, very few governments uh, put the resources that are needed to implement these laws into place. So what is your advice to the women who gather together at CSW, both at the highest level of decision making, as well as in the grassroots, as the message that they can take back to their governments. What new ideas, new strategies, new processes and policies would you charge them with as they make their journeys back home to make real the promise of CSW? A nice easy one for the oh end. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you, Rangit. <laughs> um, both Joe and I have been at CSW uh, the last three days and um, as many of you in the room will know, we didn't get an outcome last time. Uh, we're very, I guess, hopeful of an outcome this time. I'm a lot more optimistic uh, today than I was on Monday when I arrived at CSW that we would get an outcome. I think my advice uh, to um, the non-government representatives, uh, to women ministers and ambassadors and other people that are at the conference would be that we need a progressive outcome. We need a stronger outcome than we've had before. We do need to make progress. To go backwards for Australia would be unacceptable. Uh, we want to move forwards. We think that um, you know, people have enough uh, political will that it can be done. It can be done over time. And countries like the US, like New Zealand, like Australia and others uh, are willing to assist. And you know, we obviously are trying to do what we can in terms of violence against women domestically. Uh, but things can be done and progress does need to be made because some of the stories that we hear out of Africa, out of other countries in terms of uh, you know, violence being used as a weapon in war are totally unacceptable in today's world and we all need to work together. Eliminating violence against women is everybody's responsibility and we all should take it very, very seriously. And I hope that we get not just some words on a bit of paper but get some action out of CSW. Thank you. Pretty hard for me to follow with um, with more than Julie said, except that I would reiterate uh, the conclusions, and I sincerely hope they will be an agreed conclusions this time. The conclusions will have to show a clear way forward. Um, and again, I would reiterate that this must be achieved not only by nations, but by NGOs working within nations, mm -hmm. by NGOs mm -hmm. working across mm -hmm. nations, mm -hmm. by individuals who have the courage to stand up and say it's not okay. Because it's not just a government problem. Mm -hmm. The governments, mm -hmm. they count the cost, and I don't think they can ever count the cost of the misery. Mm -hmm. We put it in dollar terms, and I understand why we do. But the misery mm -hmm. and loss of life is mm -hmm. difficult to calculate that cost, but nevertheless it's there. And so my message is simply for us to see it at every level of our communities, at individual level, at NGO and community level, at government level, and see it as a task we must do together. I've been inspired by being at CSW for the first mm -hmm. time because um, I've, I've learned about things that other countries are doing that I think will add to New Zealand's plans to address. And I, I give as one example, um, I have responsibility for senior citizens and for aged care 
Um, we have put into law now that, uh, well, two things. One, um, that in fact financial abuse is also abuse, mm. but also um, that it is against our law to turn a blind to mm -hmm. turn a blind eye on abuse, mm -hmm. and that means not just the children, but also the vulnerable who are vulnerable because of disability or because of age. And so I've heard about a program in, in Canada about um, elder abuse and preventing it, so I know we can share. Mm -hmm. And whilst I'm proud of what New Zealand can do, and I'm sure Julie is proud of Australia's progress as well, I know there's so much more we need to do. Mm -hmm. And I agree with you, uh, Minister, that change happens when women make it happen. Change happened in India aft in the aftermath of the rape case because women mobilized along with men mm. and that partnership was critical to the mass movement that was unleashed in the wake of that tragedy. And women said enough is en enough. Violence happens because it is allowed to happen. That's what women said in one voice. And it happens because it is allowed to happen. We will not allow it anymore. So though that was the cry that resonated and that was the clarion call for change and for the government to come up with a, uh, with a new law on violence against women in conflict. Um, now I want to open the floor for questions. I know you're bursting with questions. Yes, you. Thank you very much. I can certainly attest that uh, I, I did see those, those uh, posters that say, uh, you know, culture is not an excuse, and, mm -hmm. and, and you had a, a Maori represented there, and, and so I, I thought I was quite impressed with that. Um, and, I, and I understand that one of my recommendations uh, for the uh, New Zealand to have its own UN Security Council Resolution 1325 mm -hmm. National Action Plan is, is being drafted right now, so thank you very much for that. Um, I do have a question for Wen Chi, and that is um, we talk about women getting in um, positions um, so, for example, UN Security Council Resolution 1325 uh, requires that women be part of the peace process. So, for example, right now you have Colombia negotiating with the FARC and the peace process there, and yet there are no women represented at the table. Um, what are we doing about this? Um, are we even, um, I was deployed down there for a year and a half in Colombia, and during that time we had Plan Colombia, and 25% of Plan Colombia was contingent on human rights certification. I would submit to you that um, ignoring a women's right ignores human rights, and if that is still the case, um, Colombia should not be recertified. So one, not be recertified, and two, it seems to me there's no pressure at all for um, Colombia to include women in these negotiations. Well, thank you for bringing that up. Um, actually, Colombia is one of our priority countries for uh, national um, uh, the Women, Peace, and Security Initiative. Um, our office actually has been working with uh, USAID to provide um, funding to support um, projects um, that would actually support uh, innovative solutions for um, NGOs and working with the government to bring women to the table. And Colombia is one of our priority countries. Uh, right. <laughs> right, and um, actually during our former ambassador, um, Milan Verveer's visit to Colombia, um, she also raised this issue with them. So um, it's not without trying, and of course this is not efficient. Um, we all have to uh, make sure that there's international community mm -hmm. coming together, mm -hmm. and you know, United States alone mm -hmm. is not going to make mm -hmm. that happen either. Mm -hmm. um, that's why we urge that you know, women's communities um, you know, can also put out the message, um, but we do what we can, which is through the government, through the funding, um, we send our message. And uh, if there's anything more we can do, we would love to work with you on that as well. Thank you, Wenchi. And I think this, um, this conversation really epitomizes what Wenchi spoke about, the coming together of different governments on shared goals and on common cause. With that, I'd like to uh, ask Hales Fandiari for a few comments. She has a distinguished history of working on, on these same issues of violence against women in the Middle East and beyond. And I want to acknowledge her role in bringing those, uh, bringing that focus to bear at the Wilson Center long before I came to the Wilson Center. 
didn't have any comments. I had a question to you. We did, um, we contacted 40 women from across the region. When I say the region, I mean the MENA region. Um, and uh, in 20 countries and asked them what they thought the challenges to women's security are. Of course, they mentioned violence against mm -hmm. women, but their main concern is also the lack of political participation, the challenge to marginalizing women through changing the personal mm -hmm. status law in the region, you know, to excluding women for economic decision. And these are all taking place in countries of the Arab Spring and the neighboring countries. So, I mean, this is something that one has to keep in mind when we discuss security issues mm -hmm. for uh, women, you know, and they feel that they are being pushed out of the public space through violence. Mm. So I would like to hear your comments and uh, we'll give you the publication afterward. <laughs> <laughs> Minister Collins is in fact Minister for Indigenous Development and Indigenous Economic Development and in the few minutes that I had with her outside uh, this session, she spoke about how um, women are often discriminated not just only because of their gender but because of their race, ethnicity, residence and religion. And so that is why I think this is so pertinent. And, and poverty and violence doesn't take place in a vacuum. And that is why some of her efforts has included even revising the family law. That's right. Um, we made changes recently to our um, family law, as I said before, where we changed the focus on, I guess, parents' rights to the rights of the child and made it much more focused on the rights of the child. Uh, when it comes to decisions about um, children and visitation and uh, custody of children uh, in family law. The other thing that we've done, um, and I don't know if we, New Zealand do this too, but in terms of homelessness and a national homelessness mm -hmm. strategy, we've been doing work with women fleeing domestic mm -hmm. violence. Uh, and if um, what can be done in terms of uh, su providing support to women, so the wraparound services, support services, but also to about... We've changed some laws to actually remove the perpetrator from the home rather than the women and the children. Mm -hmm. And that has required some states and territories to also change their laws in terms of tenancy acts and depending on whose name's on the lease and that sort of thing. But we are trying to, I guess, look at it in inventive ways and different ways of looking at the issue rather than just trying to house women fleeing domestic mm -hmm. violence in terms of shelters and then longer term accommodation mm -hmm. about what other solutions there might be. So we're always looking to see what other mm -hmm. solutions there might be because certainly, you know, domestic violence having to flee your home uh, often mm -hmm. ends up in poverty. Children, of course, are dislocated. They can't attend school uh, or go have to go to a different school. So there's a whole range of impacts mm -hmm. on uh, the woman that's had the violence mm -hmm. perpetrated against her but also the whole family unit. And often uh, women fleeing that case end up in poverty. So uh, we're looking at other ways in which we can address it. We also, of course, in Australia have a range of universal support systems that are means tested, asset and uh, uh, income tested, so there is a, a range of uh, payments and support that uh, is available th through uh, the government. So w we do also provide financial support as well as accommodation and what other things can be arranged. And similarly in India, research showed that women do not flee abusive relationships or the locus of violence because of the fear of being homeless mm -hmm. and because of the displacement that it causes to their children. And so they remain in abusive relationships because of the fear of that. And that is why the Indian law, too, uh, has provided a residency requirement. So the perpetrator has to leave. The mandatory restraining order calls for the perpetrator, who is most often a male, to leave the house and for the woman and the children to remain in the house and to be protected within that locus. Mm -hmm. Minister Goodhill? Yes, and uh, first of all, I want to just make a, a brief comment in my view, we can't address violence against women and girls without addressing the leadership and mm -hmm. the um, the economic independence. Mm -hmm. uh, they are an inextricably linked, mm -hmm. but the most painful face of it is the violence, mm -hmm. but they are inextricably linked. And I, and I believe all the work we're doing is looking at it from all of those angles. 
So New Zealand's setting is, um, yes, we have women's refuges where a woman can flee to. Mm -hmm. But what we've most recently looked at is the barriers, um, the initial phase after the violent incident mm -hmm. has taken place, and the belief that for a woman to have to flee somewhere safe, it's good that she can go somewhere safe, but we now have what we, we call a police safety order, which is on the spot at the time of the offence. Mm -hmm. So where there is insufficient evidence to arrest the person who actually committed the act of violence and take them away, then an immediate police safety order can be implemented mm -hmm. for five days. Mm -hmm. Because what was happening in, in part was that the waiting time to go before a judge or um, um, a justice of the peace to get a protection order in place mm -hmm. was seen as a barrier. And there was all of that time where the woman would be feeling vulnerable. Um, we all have probably seen the evidence that on average a woman will return five times mm -hmm. is it it will take mm -hmm. five times experiencing on average the violence mm -hmm. before mm -hmm. they Close, leave so yeah. we have protected persons programs mm -hmm. to for those who go to refuge to go into and often the um the factor the lever to get them to undertake that is if you don't want this to be the future for your children can we suggest to you that you go through this <coughs> program and understand how you can leave this violence behind in your life? And lastly, one other change to legislation um, was to put um, implicit legislation in place for a new restraining order mm -hmm. for the offender when they come out of prison mm -hmm. to be restrained right. from being anywhere near um, or because that wasn't in place before. Um, it is in place for serious crimes like murder, um, but in fact, it wasn't in place for these sorts of things. So that new restraining order, once the offender comes out of prison, is now uh, giving comfort. I'm sure it means that uh, there are many women out there that can now sleep at night. Question? More quick, yes. Thank you. Um, I have uh, a couple of questions for uh, Wen Chi. Um, the first one, we were talking about the Special Rapporteur of Women of the UN, mm -hmm. and I wonder if um, the US have been like in touch also with the Special Rapporteur of the Right of Women of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, mm -hmm. <coughs> which depend of the Organization of American States, and which are the activities, initiatives that are you doing with her? Um, and also, um, what are the efforts in order to um, ratify, ratify some of the most important convention of, uh, um, about that talks about violence against women? And one of them is the CEDAW convention, mm -hmm. and the other one, the Inter-American one, is the Convention, the Belén do Pará convention. And um, also, in the same area of the inter-American system of human rights, I wonder which important role have, has take or yeah, ha, have been taking the case, the Lenahan case Gonzalez versus mm -hmm. the US mm -hmm. um, that the commission, the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights um, filed against the US, a case of domestic violence mm -hmm. and um, restricted order. Mm -hmm. And um, for the panelists also about what what is the important role of uh, the international um, jurisprudence or the international court in the case of New Zealand and Australia mm -hmm. and the European Court of Human Rights, mm -hmm. and how you follow also the inter-American system of human rights mm -hmm. in order to change policy and and gain um, ch gain change. I mean, in, in the internal um, legislative um, policies of your country. Thank you. Wenchi, would you like to answer the question? Yeah, I can just quickly people? answer the question. Um, the first one about, um, you know, in the region, um, I'm not covering the region, and mm -hmm. I apologize that I don't have the expert knowledge, but I will make sure that um, I will ask my colleague who actually knows much more about the region to get back to you. Um, with regards to the question of CEDAW, um, as everyone knows, the United States still hasn't signed on uh, or ratify CEDAW, and um, it's not 
because our president uh, doesn't have the commitment. Actually, um, it's mm -hmm. one of the first treaties mm -hmm. that the United States, um, the White House, wanted to um, try to ratify, but uh, it's a supermajority in our Senate. It requires 66 votes. Um, and there are certain um, provisions in the in the treaty that um, you know I think some uh, members of um, our Congress do not feel comfortable, um, and I think we um, you know a, as the Obama administration we continue mm -hmm. to try to make it happen. Um, it, and again, it's not because we don't want to <laughs> ratify. It's it's really because of the our legislative process. Uh, that's making it hard. So I would urge all of you who are in the women's mm -hmm. community to continue to urge your mm -hmm. members of Congress um, to help us, you know, ratify a CEDAW as well. And um, I think this discussion would help to bolster that call. This is really, in fact, a call to the ratification of the CEDAW. And as for your question about uh, the Gonzalez case, I think the Gonzalez case really showcases the, uh, the some of the issues that we've been talking about, the ways in which law enforcement often um, refuses to respond to calls of violence against women. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Gonzalez case. This is a, a mother whose children were in the custody of the father at that particular moment, and she called the police seven to eight times, asking that the children, that the, that the visit with the father be monitored because she was afraid that there would be some violence uh, that would be committed during the time of the visit. And the police kept telling her, no, this is going to be fine. They're safe with the father. And then finally, when they found the father, that the father had, uh, father came to the police station, shot himself, and found the two dead bodies of the children in the car. And this was failure of the law enforcement, failure of the state to respond effectively to calls of help by the women. So this really goes to the heart of our discussion, the need for um, the, the need for gender sensitivity, the need to respond to acts of violence against women as <laughs> as needed. So, you know, your point on this is very well taken, and I think, you know, this discussion really helps lend itself to that. And Rashida Manju, who is the UN Special Rapporteur, whose uh, words uh, the Congresswoman quoted, I think the reason why she quoted Rashida Manju was that Rashida Manju's call to the US was really heeded, because right now we are signing the VAWA. She called for a uh, call for the ratification of the, the re-signing of the VAWA, and it shows that the U.S. does respond to international calls. Just to answer your questions briefly, Australia has um, ratified CEDAW and is in the process of implementing it at the moment. Uh, we don't have a national human rights legislation or bill federally. Um, some of our states do. Uh, so the I think the state of Victoria has got a human rights bill. Um, but. We, all, we do do a human rights test on pieces of legislation before they go through the parliament. We also have an independent human rights commission. And in fact, our sexual discrimination commissioner, Liz Broderick, is ac actually went mm -hmm. to New York to the United Nations Commission in her own right as an independent uh, human rights representative of Australia. And, and I'd just add to that, we have e um, equally an independent of government human mm -hmm. rights commissioner. And I'd just make a comment on CEDAW. Um, I presented New Zealand's seventh report to the CEDAW committee last year and gained a, a huge understanding of, um, of the process as one would when you present a report for half an hour and then are questioned by a committee of international members for five hours. <laughs> um, and and uh, on that committee are people who don't necessarily see things the same way as our government does, but the process is, is robust it is tough, and the recommendations for every nation mm. they examine mm. um, are always to strive to do better. So there will be some things that we may never agree with mm -hmm. um, that are part of the convention in terms of, for, and I'll give a, an example. New Zealand does not see, the current government does not see quotas as the way to achieve mm -hmm. equality mm -hmm. for women. We are striving for targets, and they are tough targets. Mm -hmm. As example, 45% of um, appointments to governance on state sector boards. That is mm. our target um, for women. It, so it's it's not shy. I mean, some of, some countries aim for 40% at least, but we've, we're pushing beyond that. 
but the seed oil process is, as I say, very robust and it does push mm -hmm. a country very hard. I'm quite pleased it's only every four years, although there are some reporting back after mm -hmm. two years. It's, it's quite challenging, but um, it is an international instrument um, that does keep the country on its toes. Thank you. Th thank you, Minister Goodhue. I want to conclude by thanking Congresswoman Jane Harmon for founding the Global Women's Leadership Initiative. The mission of the Global Women's Leadership Initiative is the 50 by 50 mission. We are talking of quotas, we are talking of targets. So our target is 50% women at decision making at the decision making levels. We've been talking with the ministers about how in their countries, in both in New Zealand and in Australia, women exceed the target of 50% in public service. But what we are aiming at 50% women in decision making levels and at the decision making process. Um, uh, so I want to thank her for founding this and making all of this possible, but most of all to our two distinguished ministers from Australia and New Zealand. This is just the beginning of an enduring relationship with both of you. We know that we are going to partner with you on the Women in Public Service project and take forward many of the uh, points that we've discussed this afternoon and to institutionalize some of the issues that we've discussed at a very, uh, at a level where Australia can share your best practices and lessons learned with, uh, with not just the women in Australia and the region, but across the world. And thank you very much, uh, Wenchi, for bringing the ministers to us and for forging a closer relationship and a closer nexus with both Australia and New Zealand and for this invaluable partnership with the Global Women's, um, with the Office of the Global Women's Issues at the State Department. And thank you all of you for celebrating International Women's Day with all of us and the CSW process. Thank you. <laughs>